Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. And we are so happy to have you join us on this topic of designing the procurement virtual factory, reinventing procurement through a platform. What I'd like to do to get started with the webinar uh, this, this morning or this afternoon or this evening, depending upon where you're joining us from, is uh, just some introductions of our panelists. And then talking about this idea of procurement, the procurement virtual factory, reinventing procurement through a platform. Well, then, as, as Chrissy said, go through some Q&A and hopefully some of you garner some questions and, you know, on a topic that uh, requires a lot of thinking and pe some pensive uh, ideas here of uh, what this means for the future of procurement. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Pierre Mitchell. He is a, a recognized uh, research analyst who's been in the industry for some time and the chief research officer and managing partner today at Azul Partners, also known as Spend Matters. So, Pierre, welcome, uh, welcome on the webinar today. Thank you, Constantine. I appreciate it. How is uh, how is the weather out in Boston? Are we uh, are we good? Is it mild? Is it is it spring like it is here in Chicago? <laughs> well, it's uh, it's more and more it's uh, it's volatile. It'll be really um, you know get three feet of snow one day and then it'll be in the 50s and 60s the next day. So it's like a supply chain example. It's not about the average. It's around the variation that'll get you sometimes. So <laughs> there you go. Right. There you go. Thanks, Pierre. And then also joining us is my colleague, Julian Nadeau, who is our Chief Product Officer at Determine. And uh, Julian, you are joining us from uh, Atlanta, or sometimes I call it Hotlanta. How, how are you doing down there in Atlanta today? I'm doing great. So Atlanta is uh, no, it's pretty nice. So it's pretty warm. It's, uh, it's almost a spring now. The spring solid uh, last week. So no, no, it's pretty cool. Excellent. Thank you, guys. And we're looking forward to, uh, to getting this kicked off. Again, I'm Constantine Limbarak, VP of Product Marketing here at Determine, uh, joining you from Chicago. As we go into the, the topic, what we'd like to do is just to make sure everyone has a framework for um, you know, our, our host today, Spend Matters, and talking through a little bit of the background if you're not familiar with what they do and why we partner with them. So, Pierre, I don't know if you want to give us a few words here on what Spend Matters does and we can then jump into the core of the topic. Yeah, sure. I won't spend much time because we had a lot of content to get to. But yeah, basically we run a bunch of um, advisory services and websites that are focused on uh, procurement and supply chain. We have some that are focused by vertical. We have some category um, sites, uh, Metal Miner being one of them. We work in the public sector. Um, we have some different geographic sites uh, like in Latin America and in, and in UK. So, um, but all focused on, um, you know, helping uh, practitioners and the providers who serve them really make good choices around um, solutions, technology solutions, um, other types of um, you know services uh, solutions. Uh, you know to really get the uh, best value out of the supply markets, which is ultimately what procurement's uh, all about. So, thanks, Pierre. And in working with Spend Matters, if you're not familiar with who we are, as Determine, we're in the software as a service industry and supply management and contract management. And we work uh, with a number of different providers like Spend Matters and, and with our clients and partners to better understand what's happening in the procurement space. We also offer, again, as you might know, a, a recognized cloud platform. And when we talk about this idea of, of what's happening in the procurement space with, with platforms, it becomes something uh, of an important factor for understanding how you decide on what solutions to use and what the impacts of the future of, of procurement uh, technology means. And with that, one thing that we've come across and we've, we've kind of decided on the idea or notion of what it means to have a platform is the ability to achieve something that we're calling platformance. And we're saying that platformance isn't just a technology, but it's when people are really empowered in using uh, the a technology to its highest standard that brings people together and achieving a certain sense of uh, of efficiency and normalization and a new way of looking at how they're trying to achieve enterprise success. So today we're going to talk about platforms, and again, if you do a Google search, there are a lot of kinds of platforms out there, political ones, physical ones, shoes, et cetera. But the platforms we're going to really focus on are what some of these vendors here that we see that are some of the most recognizable brands that are out there, like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, have presented to us over the past several years in terms of how they're evolving B2B or B2C and how we're seeing that now be impacted in the B2B environment. 
And uh, there's a book that we came across uh, in, in preparing for this webinar called The Age of the Platform by Phil Simon. And really his comment here is I think the, the core of what we're we're going to be really focusing on in the webinar today. And what he's saying here is, today the most successful companies are operating under an entirely different business model, one predicated on collaboration, emerging technologies, externally driven innovation, different types of partnerships, and vibrant ecosystems. And so with that, what we're going to see here is, is how are we seeing what we're looking and experiencing with the Amazons and Facebooks and Googles and others uh, and how that's impacting what we're going to try to achieve in procurement over, say, the next five to ten years. So what I'd like to do now is turn this over to Pierre and, and have us start thinking about this topic and uh, understand what this means for, for procurement. So, Pierre, it's all yours. Thanks, Constantine. And um, I, thanks, everyone, for attending. I know uh, everybody's crazy busy these days with the, uh, the new normal, so we're going to try to make this a good value add for this. So. A platform is one of those terms that is uh, so ubiquitous, it's, it's kind of become meaning, uh, a bit meaningless. So we're going to try to put a little more precision to the term and uh, see how you can apply that to uh, the procurement world. So um, if you kind of just compare this idea of feature thinking versus platform thinking. So feature thinking, if you look on the left, you have the Pontiac Aztec. Designed by committee, you know, decades ago, people were starting to get into SUVs. You know, you took everybody's requirements and you tried to create kind of one vehicle that uh, did everything for everybody, but it ended up really satisfying, you know, nobody. It was, uh, you know, the kind of the software equivalent to the feature 500 list, you know, take everybody's orders, kind of do some multi-voting, throw it all in there, and let's see what you get. And then you get a design by committee type of product. Um, a Tesla, on the other hand, is, is designed very differently. Um, really designed first as a physical platform in terms of, you know, the uh, the chassis with uh, the you know the thousand laptop batteries and parallel. There's a lot of great design innovations around it, but it's highly modular and and obviously the ultimate ex the extensibility of that is into the software. You go in there if you haven't gone and just at least sat in one and really played around with it on on the on the on the dashboard and uh, you can even buy it just by digitally signing uh, by right within the vehicle um, itself. It's re it's really impressive. And the key about the software aspect is that. By using software, you can really take advantage of this idea of um, platforms, which is really the ability to extend the use of um, a product out to all of the suppliers and consumers of that product. In this case, kind of the, the, the information as we talk about this next row, which is the BlackBerry versus, you know, Android or um, iOS or Microsoft, you know, smartphones. Um, you know, BlackBerry, great, you know, fit for purpose, really, um, you know, secure and works well, but not really a platform with a rich developer, you know, ecosystem that is going to, um, you know, be something that um, learns from the user. It can be personalized highly by the user in terms of the apps that are provided, but on the supply side has a whole ecosystem of developers and partners that are used to kind of, um, you know, make it really big, do almost anything for you. Everybody's so tethered to the smartphones these days. It really talks about uh, the ubiquity of it and the the power of of that platform. And now let's talk about procurement and and procurement apps. So procurement organizations. Um, something we're going to get. This is the, the the meat of the content we'll get into is rather than having kind of a one size fits all procurement organization and a, procure, a set of procurement processes and sourcing or in P two P. You know, how do we design it that's much more geared towards what the users are trying to do and give them some involvement in the use of um, the system? And, and the same then goes for the technology. I mean, do you quite often, uh, you know, most organi procurement organizations have a real kind of just like the Aztec is a hodgepodge of different, you know, functionality. They have a real hodgepodge of systems of, you know, ERP and custom and e-invoicing and SharePoint and, you know, just lots of stuff all over the place, which, you know, they're really looking to, you know, get better, um, you know, consolidation um, within the application portfolio, but at the same time, they're trying to get more innovation. So this is the idea where, where um, platforms can help, and I thought the greatest quotable quote around this was Elon Musk with regards to the Tesla Gigafactory, where he said, you know, the real problem, the real difficulty, and where the biggest potential is, is building the machine that makes the machine. In other words, you know, it's building the factory. And he's like, um, I'm really thinking of the factory like a product. And that's kind of the essence of this. So if you think of, you know, procurement um, like um, not just a, 
a pipeline of, let's say, uh, transaction processing or on the sourcing side, you know, savings uh, creation, you know, projects and just, you know, the savings machine, it's fine and it's good to have it industrialized and we'll talk about that a little bit in, in um, a second, but really what you're, what you're trying to do is to kind of think a little bit more broadly on how do you use procurement as a platform for helping, you know, folks in the enterprise tap supply markets to get, you know, to get you know, uh, advantage from all the innovations that are going on, you know, out there. And that's through technology or just through, you know, in, 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 in manufacturing. So this idea of platforms, not pipes, and there's a whole book on platforms, which is, talks more, more about this, this idea, you see it everywhere. And that's why it is kind of a ubiquitous term. So you see it in mobile devices, as we talked about. You see it in enterprise apps, right? So Salesforce on the CRM side having a whole ecosystem of partner apps and things where you can kind of bolt, you know, um, add-on solutions on very relatively seamlessly so that you're not tied to just one giant monolithic, you know, uh, code set. Amazon, same thing, right, in terms of it's not just an e-tailer, you know, if you look at Amazon business, it is a multi-supplier, multi-seller marketplace. Even though you can almost say, well, gosh, it's just like an e-tailer. No, they've kind of positioned it much more as, now a logistics platform and things that they can do to help the ecosystem and not just be, you know, not just be yet another kind of retail out there, you know, hawking wares. So Amazon wants to be pervasive in platforms in lots of areas, including in infrastructure with Amazon Web Services. And then, of course, you know, coming into your home with Alexa as, you know, as uh, I, I saw something that was like AI is the new UI, right? So this kind of ability to make this kind of stuff ubiquitous by learning from the users of the system and letting them customize it to their own needs. So that's the idea of kind of customizing and configure it, really configuring to order rather than this kind of one size fits all kind of um, capability. So I, I want to bring in Julian on this. So um, you know, because I kind of look at things much more broadly, but he's kind of he's in the he's in the factory making procurement solutions for everyone. So uh, Julian, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, just your thoughts on how do you, how have you kind of, you know, helped work with clients to kind of go beyond the feature 500 list and try to offer some things to kind of have it more configurable and let them take more ownership and, and involvement in the development of, of, of the solutions. Yeah, sure. And I mean, everything you say may make a lot of sense everywhere, but if you look at the procurement actually. Uh, we are pretty late in this in this area. I mean, we you talked about Salesforce, you talked about many platform B two B two B B two C platform, and on the procurement since it's, it has been driven by um, finance, procure ERP. Uh, we have been quite late on that, but we we have a huge trend right now. I mean, what you said about the procurement getting more uh, mature means that the customer right now, they don't want anymore to manage PO catalog or saving or whatever. They want much more than that. Uh, I mean, the, the world is changing. Uh, company have to adapt to the, to the world in a quick way. Time is, uh, is a key critical for now. And what they want actually is not to say, okay, I'm going to implement a new software uh, with this list of features, these 500 features. Uh, what they need actually is to solve pain points and to keep solving pain points every every month, every quarter, every year. Uh, so now that the technology allows us to provide this factory, actually, uh, we started to create this factory for ourselves first as a platform provider. And the big trend we see right now is the customer is asking, okay, so you have this factory, you can do online configuration, you can solve any problem anytime. Uh, can I do that as well inside my company? So everything you said about is the technology enabling the ability for the platform, not only to, to adapt, to be built, to connect to third-party provider, to any services on the, uh, on the cloud or everywhere, but it's a huge trend actually. So it's going very fast once you know the, the capability of what we can do with the, with the technology. That's great, thanks. And um, uh, absolutely, it is. It is amazing how much the technology is, is exploding. And you know, and people will say, "Well, gosh, you know, how, how complex you know is procurement?" But when you really get into it, obviously, it can get really complicated with regards to all the category-specific needs, all the stakeholder-specific needs, etc. So, how do you, you know, there's this question of how do you manage that complexity of of all these you know customers, if you will, with with all this demand and 
um, you know, it's a, it's a good, there's some good learnings from the supply chain and from manufacturing that really directly applies from, you know, making goods to making um, services, in this case, procurement services to really help industrialize the process. And one of the biggest things is kind of how do we go to kind of a supply driven, one size fits all kind of mindset, you know, to something that we move much more to a stakeholder driven, demand driven kind of um, model. So if you think about a modern kind of, you know, physical factory that's oriented around a product, uh, the first the first concept is really this idea of demand driven. And how do we not just do one size fits all? You know, how do we actually, um, you know, not just uh, create that Pontiac Aztec and throw it out there and hope that it works, but actually how do we understand that demand a bit better and basically move to kind of a configured order, make to order kind of, um, solution and the way to do that over on the procurement side is really doing stakeholder management and customer management, if you will, some com customers, but whatever, um, is not just doing category management, which is category sourcing. In other words, let's look at our spend, let's rationalize the suppliers, let's kind of you know downsize, reduce some prices, push it out there, and that's and we just keep turning the crank and just keep repeating those drive-by sourcing events, that, and hopefully those agreements will be good enough. And hopefully the P2P processes and the requisitioning processes that we throw out there is going to be, you know, good enough, even though it's not really tailored to what the, you know, to, to, to those stakeholders, you know, that's not, that's going to tend not to work, um, you know, very well. So the idea is look at number two is this idea of making sure that you can execute and, and that you can promise what you said you would do. So this is in the manufacturing city of capable to promise. Um, so in the procurement side, uh, procurement has to do the same thing. It has to execute. It has to know what its stakeholders want. And the single most predictive, you know, uh, best practice in world-class procurement organizations is the early involvement in planning and budgeting. By getting involved early, we know what they're looking for. We can get ahead of the, we can see their contracts coming up for renewal. We can, act, we can really get involved in uh, aligning to their projects and really, um, you know, make their project portfolio the same as, you know, customer, the procurement's project portfolio and align to that rather than everything showing up at, you know, the 11th hour. So that's a key notion really around planning and capacity and being able to certainly that you could really execute because you never want to disappoint your stakeholders, but you also want to let them know, you know, whether you can do what they're looking to do. And the best way to do that is get ahead of it. The third idea is really around segmentation and configuration, configurable routings, flow lines, cells, cellular manufacturing. You know, we could really just spend a whole... <laughs> a couple hours just on this this slide, but the same the idea on the procurement side is don't just have a 99 step you know sourcing process. Don't just have a you know three step process. You re the whole nature of cat the whole idea of category management is to tailor your procurement processes and strategies and the use of specific tools to the nature of the spend itself, right? And if you're going to do that, you have to obviously have the flexible you know tools and technologies you know, to be able to do that, which ties to number four, which is you want to also be able to use this idea of fail-safing or poke yoke or, um, don't get too much into this, but really the ability to fail-safe stuff. And this is where technology is really great, where you can um, actually not just make the, the, the solution flexible, but you can actually make it fail-safe. In other words, put in monitoring, escalation, alerts, um, really, and try to really help folks um, in a very noisy world pay attention to the things that are really most important to them and really, um, you know, risks that are out there and, and things that they should just be focusing on. Okay, uh, five and six. This is really around collaboration and alignment. Um, this is with your internal partners and also with your external partners. Same thing here, right? Procurement cannot do this alone, especially as things go digital. you got to be aligned with IT, right? And it, what we did, we've done two big studies just on focusing on procurement alignment with IT and, and alignment with finance. Both are absolutely critical. Finance really key on the indirect side around spend management and the budgeting and planning and FP&A and treasury and all these things, right? You got to align with these two, certainly these two key stakeholders and with others. Just like you need to do on the shop floor, you got to work with quality. And on both sides, you have to be able to integrate with your suppliers into the process. Um, on, the, on the shop floor, using JIT2 and other things to kind of really VMI and really bring in suppliers to kind of be tightly involved as an extension of your manufacturing process. Same thing with procurement, right? It's all about um, aligning with your suppliers, being a customer of choice, really understanding what they're going through and offering them 
easy ways to connect with you, to collaborate with you, and obviously that speaks to the technology um, side. And I'm sure, you know, I'm going to give Julian a chance to just talk about uh, just uh, a lot of the, the the technology aspects, you know, of this. And then lastly, this kind of piece around uh, transparency of the process and opening it up and letting the process participants take, you know, uh, take part in it. This is absolutely fundamental to the quality area and how we really let process owners really own the process, improve it, see what's going on, and really um, take ownership. It's not designed on high and sent down to you know the masses. They're actually involved in the tailoring of the, the, the whole process. Um, and, and that includes going all the way back to design. And similarly on the procurement side, right, we want to be able to let stakeholders really participate and, and do as, you know, let them do as much as they can and push as much as we can to the stakeholders to let them, you know, uh, do best practices driven, you know, procurement and not have it co completely reliant on just the procurement organization for that, you know, to, to, to do it. So this is a way in which you can kind of get influence without necessarily being on the hook for, for everything. And the design for manufacturability is this idea of not just, you know, designing everything and sourcing and throwing it over the wall, all the P2P, and hopefully that's all going to work well. You know, if you do a super complex transportation bid and just hope it's going to work well on supply chain execution, but you don't have good transportation systems, guess what? You know, you're not going to have compliance. It's not going to work. And the same thing goes with, you know, all spend categories. You got to really understand who's going to be using those suppliers and those agreements and how they're going to be interacting with them. So you have to design a source to pay process really end to end. You can't just, you know, separate sourcing and P2P and just, you know, hopefully by magic they're going to work together. And so, um, Julie, I know, I've, you know, I've covered a lot of ground here, but, you know, out of, you know, some of these topics, what are some of the ones that you most see, you know, some of the biggest points uh, around, you know, how technology is helping um, this uh, evolution? Yeah, I mean, everything you Everything you said here uh, just shows the complexity of uh, what can be procurement, actually. Uh, when, when we think of what we have been providing for years uh, to manage simple, what, what we call simple procurement, uh, like SKU number on the catalog, you search, you create a cart, you send a PO receiver, you match uh, that with an invoice. It's it's really indirect and or pro, even even the direct uh, procurement actually it's uh, it's all configured by the ERP. Uh, so all of that I mean works, but once you get into all these points uh, on what we call the, the the complex procurement, it's it's very very difficult to have a solution which is just a software that fits the needs. There is no way, and the services, services procurement is is a very good example. Uh, services procurement, actually, you can have many, many types of services procurement, whatever it's a contingency labor, scope of work, um, scope of work, is that IT services, is that marketing services, is that, uh, you know, people, is that companies, subcontractor, whatever. It's very, very complex. And today, when we look at the solution in the market, uh, I mean, placing a PO, uh, just managing a contract, doing uh, an RFP, doesn't fit the need of a good process for the for the services procurement, for example. And that's where the, the platform can help a lot because the platform allows actually to assemble uh, all these pieces, like I manage the contract, uh, I do an RFP, I, I manage the project, I collaborate with a team, I use the portal to communicate with the supplier, uh, I use whatever features which are in the platform but I tied all of that together to manage a business process. And when you think of getting this complex process management, you think about managing the business of the company. So that means that each company has a different business, and as a business, they manage differently the uh, very, very complex procurement as well, on top of you know whatever everybody is doing the same on buying pens or computer, these kind of things. So I mean that, that points to the to the complexity of, for, of how to how to deliver a solution that can answer all these questions actually. Well, you you uh, you perfectly um, uh, transitioned me to a little bit of this, this this kind of key idea of how do you do this notion of uh, in in the manufacturing world this notion of mass customization right so which is how do you make it look through a common process like the end customer is really getting something that has been engineered to order just for them. It looks completely bes bespoke, you know, one-off for them. But yet, 
it's really just part of the same process. So it's this, they're in, in, uh, the t in technology world, in, in the area of object-oriented programming, there's this concept called polymorphism. And this is your word for the day. See if you can try to incorporate it into your next cocktail party. Um, so polymorphism basically is, that, is the concept that an object will behave differently based on what other object is calling it or invoking it. And the idea is things are done in context. So I like beer. If I go to uh, you know, Google and, I, and it doesn't know who I am, I'm not signed in as me, and I type in uh, alchemist, you know, it might say, oh, here's a great book or a, a Wikipedia around someone who turns something into gold. When I'm logged in, it knows that I like beer. So when I type in alchemist, it says, ah, you're looking for the alchemist brewery. That's, you know, one state over that you, that you love so much. So in other words, it, it really understands who I am. It knows, and actually more and more on the B2C side, frightening, <laughs> frightening level of understanding of who I am, where I've been, what I've spent, what I might, what I'm trying to do, what I might be trying to do, in other words, predictive analytics, you know, with whom and et cetera. And based on that, it's going to serve up, you know, content and workflow and security and th things that's going to tailor to my experience. And it might even be the terminology itself. So this is an example for procurement. So procurement should not be a one-size-fits-all. Um, it should be tailored to stakeholders. So if I'm a category manager working in marketing, I might not want to use the terms spend. I might want to use the term investment. They don't like talking about costs and spend. They like talking about investment. So there's terminology that's, you know, that's different as well as the processes that might be different as well as the functionality that might be different. So let's give some um, examples. So this is, the, this is, I gave the Google example because Amazon is a pretty easy example of, okay, we have saved carts and, you know, things, things like that and order history um, and that's fine, right? But, you know, that this whole personalization piece is much deeper and the modern platforms that are out there that can really understand who you are, what you've done before, what category you're looking for, uh, and all the, the this uh, more complexity in this will provide much better functionality. So I'll give some examples. So on the P2P side, you know, let's not have one giant three-way match, you know, job shop. We might want to have two-way uh, matching with assumed receipts. We might have evaluated receipts. Uh, we might want to have P-card. We might have three-way, four-way matching. Um, regardless, I want to be able to um, help that end user go down the right transactional path as well as to you know find the right supplier. So that's the notion of guided buying where the procurement organization is, at, well, really the, 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 the buying organization is helping that user find what they need but still have it be within compliance. So you see this a lot in travel systems, right, in terms of here, you know, here's everything that you need. By the way, here's the preferred hotel that you should use. Please try to use this one. If it's, uh, if you don't use it, you know, maybe you need an approval, that type of thing. Same with contracts, this notion of how do we get to guided contracting that's in context of what you're trying to do on, on the sourcing side. Well, you know, as you go through these different types of um, of sourcing, whether it's strategic sourcing, tactical sourcing, a renewal, whatever you want to guide, you'd love to guide the whole process from the beginning, but when you get to contracting, how do we not just have, you know, convert paper contracts over to electronic, but also build a clause library and, and on top of that build some rules that say, depending on the nature of your spend, so we're getting a contract or coming on site, touching IT equipment, that's going to maybe um, guide the sets of templates that um, the, the clauses that we draw from that clause library, and basically create kind of a configure to order compliant, um, you know, which legal can still review uh, contract rather than you having to engineer it from scratch, you know, every time or use very crude, high level, you know, kind of of templates. So uh, when you think about this notion of category management. It's all of these things, right? It, it's this ability to, uh, to, you know, not just your traditional categories, but mega categories like contingent labor. Um, if you're outsourcing, you might have some different rules where your processes are actually executed by third parties. You may actually have mashup categories, which is focused on an end user outcome. So if I'm doing a, an event, a big, a big marketing event, a convention or something, uh, you know, I might be having lots of spend, you know, travel and marketing services and uh, promotional materials, these kinds of things, right? All this complexity needs to be handled explicitly um, in the system. And of course, 
tailored to the right language and currency. And this really requires this kind of next-gen kind of data model and functionality that can allow this kind of flexibility to make that system look like custom, even though it's a cloud-based suite and that you can just upgrade it, no problem, and it will continue to involve. It's the best of both worlds, and that really requires strong, a well-designed technology platform, but also procurement has to think, too, about how it's trying to drive that kind of configurability within its process so that it can really scale more effectively um, because, you know, procurement's trying to do more and more things with basically the same budget. And the only way it can do that is by fundamentally rethinking how it offers these kind of mass, you know, customized processes with a technology platform that is mass personalized that can kind of deal with this. So again, a lot of a lot of content here, um, and the, uh, the the presentation will be available for download at the end of this. But um, Julian, I'm going to draw you in on, on this one again. Um, uh, you probably see this kind of personalization in lots of areas. I mean, I gave a lot of examples. I mean, any any of that kind of just jump to mind where people are looking for that flexibility in, in, in the platform? Gosh, it's a, it's a huge topic, actually. So uh, put it this way, uh, we moved from uh, Pond Solution, actually, and Pond Solution used to be very focused on a, on a very specific need, actually, uh, to SaaS platform. The SaaS platform, the beauty about it is it's out of the box, it's ready, uh, great adoptions, easy. The thing is, when you go into a SaaS platform, actually, uh, you get what you get, meaning that you you get the, the the average about everything. You can manage things, but you cannot adapt the solution to your to to very specific needs. So that means that if you want to manage your company correctly, you need a test solution. You need uh, some verticalized solution for contingency labor, or for uh, vendor management, or whatever, or for event management, and you may need actually additional solution that you can build yourself, like a BPM solution where you put your own rules to manage your own business, actually, which is specific to your to your organization. And the question is, if you have all these solutions, how can you, I mean, how can you manage your, your data correctly? How can you manage a, a complete flow between the, the use of a vendor uh, under contingent labor using a, a PO that goes into the finance organization, you know, all of that. So it's it's a big mess, actually. So if you think of you want out-of-the-box, best-in-class solution, ready to be used, uh, I click on a button and I get what I need. And that's exactly what you want. But at the same time, you want to manage your, your processes. You want to adapt to your needs. Uh, you want to, to, I mean, to adapt to any need, actually, uh, especially when, when we talk about the complex procurements. And that's where we go into the, the configuration. So the configuration is you take an out-of-the-box, best-in-class um, platform, actually, with best, best practices, the workflow, which are pre-designed. And what you want, you want to adapt that. So you want to configure everything. The trap with that is if you make the configuration too complex, then nobody is able to, to manage it. And we had a good example, uh, two examples, actually. One was the, um, the configuration of uh, optimization, for example, when you do a sourcing event and you want to, to automate, automate the, the, uh, the calculation and so on, and you have to build your own rules. It's fine, you can do everything, but it's too complex. So few people use that, so you miss the point. The same for let's say, product recommendation. You want to make sure that uh, when you do a procurement, the user gets exactly the product that you want them to get and everything quickly. If you have to configure everything up front, it's very complex. So our challenge, actually, is to be able to make the system work by default and add any, any technology, actually, that allows you to easily configure or adapt the system to your needs and bring some smart application like machine learning, for example, that helps you based on what you do, what the user are doing actually on the platform, uh, achieving the, these, uh, these processes. So it's a it's very complex uh, topic actually. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Um, I, I was thinking about, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about the very simple example of, um, you know, if you have like an equalizer, you know, and there's different settings, you know, there's rock and jazz and, you know, there's some, 
out of the box kind of, you know, maybe things that need to be set because with these modern systems, when there's so much that's configurable, the configuration is almost overwhelming. So you have to kind of simplify the the, the configuration it, um, itself. And what seems to be really interesting is I see solutions like yours and a couple other leading, you know, platforms is more and more this idea of kind of uh, design thinking and really modern user interfaces that are not just you know, uh, visually pleasing and, uh, you know, has style guides and, like, material design or, what you know, what it, pick your favorite style. But they're very much kind of oriented towards um, one kind of understanding what the user's trying to do and then only kind of giving them the functionality and complexity that's really, um, that, that, you know, that's really, uh, that they need um, and not giving them kind of, all right, here's the giant, you know, blue screen with 50 fields and it's got everything you could possibly want. You just have to know how to navigate through it. So, you know, go mm -hmm. see that desktop procedure and it's like, okay, you know, now we've got the, you know, now we've got that Pontiac Aztec <laughs> again. Um, so how do we make it um, very adaptive, both visually and to the work style, um, and really serve up the things that are um, appropriate? And I think you talked about this, uh, I think we'll talk about it on the next slide, kind of how do you deal with much richer types of data, but just from a process standpoint, you know, how can we pull in, how can we do something like, okay, punch out to, let's say, the Amazon supply for, like, tailspin, right, and then come back in and continue on. How can we use digital signatures, you know, to for uh, whoever, DocuSign or whatever, and just kind of, let's not chase wet ink, it's stupid, right, on paper. Let's plug in, you know, some, some, uh, rapid ratings, lookups, and to see, you know, what uh, for, you know, a supplier financial risk score, uh, whatever it is. Really assembling that stuff to order and to do that, you know, obviously having the platform that lets you plug those services in and make the experience for that user very easy. And, you know, and there's this notion of B2C around freemium, which is really not so much the commercial side, but just making it really easy to start and add value, and then adding more and more value over time. And that's the same thing with procurement as a solution provider, is how do we make it really easy to do business with procurement? How do we just be able to find procurement, know who to talk to, you know, where's the easy button, where's the help button that helps me, you know, find, find the folks in procurement. But also, you know, when collaborating with procurement, how can we actually add value to what that stakeholder is trying to do, get some quick wins, and say, hey, you know what? Procurement's actually a help here. They're not a they're not a hindrance. They're actually they're actually helping me get more value out of my budget and out of my suppliers. And that is the inflection point in a procurement transformation journey when they see you as actually being helpful rather than just being you know uh, you know not just a gatekeeper but actually a gate opener and a, and a value adder and a business partner. That's the for procurement. That's the big thing. And and this is why you know having you don't want to let technology get in the way of a really, you know, and have this kind of really bad user experience with kind of old ERP or just old technology, you know, platforms. It's stupid to have the technology really leave a bad taste in the, biz the business users and the, and the stakeholders. mouth and you're trying to do much more um, important things. So um, this idea of design thinking is just as important for procurement as it is for the solutions providers that help procurement to really empathize what that um, what that budget owner is trying to do and then serve up the kind of processes and technology that is really going to be uh, helpful to, to, to them. And, and increasingly, it's bringing this outside-in perspective. It's bringing in communities. It's, br it's bringing in this power of the network without actually having to drag the user out to a... Uh, um, you know, the walled gardens, proprietary kind of, you know, networks that are out there, but bringing the power of those networks into the business process to, you know, to help them, you know, manage that um, process better. And that process might be around just having a better, you know, marketing event or in a better, for a road warrior, just having a less, a, 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 a more friction-free, you know, business trip and making it easier for them to do what they need to do to, you know, add to the top line or whatever. So design thinking is an important um, principle and it's important for procurement to apply to its own processes and not just to technology. So um, Julian, you know, you, you spend a lot of time around, um, you know, the uh, design thinking and material design and all these different things. 
What, what do you think has been, um, you know, kind of the most uh, B2C centric kind of capability or innovation or things that where this design thinking has been used very heavily? Um, you know, at, what are some of the things that are really most applicable that you're that you're seeing as adding, you know, for you and for your customers? Yeah, and actually, the, this complexity of having access to everything. I mean, you have your phone and you can do everything, right? So it has been solved by the, by the B2C, actually, uh, meaning that as a, as, a, as a standard people, you can do today a lot of things very powerful uh, with the platform available today that, I mean, everybody can do. Uh, my son can use Alexa, uh, tie that to a skier, uh, create a rule on IFTTT, to turn the light on and turn the TV on at the same time. They can do that. It looks pretty complex. It's a, it's a process. It's almost a business process. They can do it, right, using just the phone. So by learning, actually, on what is on the available by the B2C, uh, we can solve a lot, a lot of business, pro uh, business problems, actually. And typically, to, to what you say, um, let's talk about on procurement. Let's talk about how to how to buy. If you look at people, they are used to Amazon, right? So we have been. I mean, everybody is looking for the Amazon-like uh, technology in terms of uh, accessing products, uh, searching, and these kind of things. Everybody is looking at Google in terms of ease of searching anything on the platform. Not only searching, but doing things. The search engine starts as not only I want to look for something, I want to look at how can I do this, actually, and the search engine is going to give you the answer. Um, talking about DocuSign, DocuSign is just a way to completely embed the digital signature on, on, the, on the process, which is very, very easy. I mean, you receive whatever, an email or notification in your phone, you click a button, you, you sign, and you're done. So it's really a technology that comes from the almost from, from the B2C. And all of that is tied together with some, again, with, we're talking about artificial intelligence, but the artificial intelligence is what brings everything together and gives you the, the right experience based on your needs, actually. So a lot of, lot of things are coming um, from, from the B2C. Another example, maybe, is on the collaboration. It has been always a big deal to, to get people involved, uh, answering questions, even in company, I mean, everybody knows that email is becoming a, a, a real a real pain in a company, actually, sending email, receiving. So you have a bunch of new technology for communication, like Slack or people, Skype or whatever. So now people expect to use whatever uh, collaboration technology to interact with the platform. So the next step may be uh, Google Assistant, but for now, uh, I mean, I should be able to use the tool I use every day to ask a question or to do something or to, to get an answer. I mean, whatever. Uh, and I should be able to use Skype or Slack or, or my email or my phone or whatever to work with the platform. So that, that's the most demanding uh, technology, actually, that the uh, customer and people are looking for because that's what they use every day. Yeah, yeah, and actually, that's why that's a great that's a great point. And that's why I mean, I feel like the, the Uber example at the end. So, and this is a very you know a very practical one, which is, um, you know, business travelers love Uber because or Lyft, you know, or whatever you know the service you're using, you know, they just love it because it's so easy to use on your smartphone. The service works, and Uber, of course, you know, is a platform, and you know, and it's it's a way of, uh, and it's a very smart supply chain, which is, you know, hundreds of thousands of, you know, con contract contractors and their and their vehicles to manage the supply chain of, you know, you and <laughs> moving you around. Um, but, you know, rather than treating Uber as some kind of maverick thing with that, uh, you know, you don't want employees to use, you know, more and more procurement organizations and or just, you know, and travel, you know, organizations are, are beginning to really like Uber because of the fact that, now there is integration into it. The travelers really like it. It's um, you know it's much more friction free. You have automated detail. You can download it into the expense reports. You have a full detail of where everybody went on those trips. You can see the the, the rates with the surge pricing. You can actually it's better from a security standpoint in terms of knowing you know being able to um, be in contact and know where your business travelers are in case there's any issues. There's um you know if you can really embrace it and really work with the end users to enable them 
to satisfy what they're trying to do and satisfy what you're trying to do from a regulatory or control standpoint, that's the real win-win, and that is good design. You know, think about Quicken Loans, you know, engineered to amaze. I mean, I've used Quicken Loans, and it's great. I mean, it really is engineered, and, and, the, and the, the power of, of Quicken Loans is the online super easy guided kind of process that underneath it they map you know what you're trying to do with all your mortgage you know your mortgage process into the you know hundreds or thousands of different documents that are required to be signed within your specific locality and it's you know they understand the regulations that are in force within your state within your city and they thread this thing together and they shield you from all that complexity and just make it a really easy process. So it really is, you know, engineered to make it um, a much less of a Byzantine process and much more of a delight um, process. And um, that's one of the reasons why they've just been doing so well. So lots of good examples. Okay, so let's finish up. We got our last piece, in, um, and uh, Julian, you, you alluded to this, which was on the AI. And I don't want to get too much into this, but, um, you know, this is kind of like my... Um, theory of everything kind of model, which is, you know, if you want to think about how to think about this concept of digital business and digital um, transformation, I think one of the easiest ways to think about it is you have a bunch of assets of, of any kind, you know, physical assets of, you know, humans and machines and materials and whatever. More and more everything is kind of getting digitized, right? And this is Internet of Things, you know, sensors. Um, that are out there and servers and smartphones basically, you know, becoming almost like supercomputers in your back pocket. Um, but as that stuff gets digitized and this massive, you know, kind of big data that becomes out there, how do we take the information from that data and within the context of so, um, cloud applications and, other, and that are threading together this, this data and these other types of services, web services um, and microservices, how do we thread that together in a business process that um, is not just managing low-level data, but it's actually understanding what we're trying to do as a business. What is the, the knowledge and the insight and the intelligence that's actually using this data to support a business process? And that ability to kind of move from data to information to much more structured knowledge and analytics are really just a way to help, um, you know, create that insight and higher-level um, insight. And, you know, business intelligence, and I know a lot of that, as a, it's a dirty word because it's been very simple, structured internal data, but more and more as we start to have all this data that's outside in, big data, how do we bring that together into, you know, to the business process? So there's this bottoms up kind of digitization and evolution of the data to higher level kind of, you know, uh, information and knowledge. At the same time, what's going on with AI is we are, um, learning from humans how, how, you know, kind of inputs and outputs, what are they doing to, uh, how do we learn from the human mind to kind of uh, emulate that and take that and put it into a digital platform. And sometimes we don't even know how it works. It's a big black box, you know, neural net machine learning. Uh, but it's, it's, that can add a lot of value if you're doing spend analysis to auto-classify dirty spend into a nice well-defined spend taxonomy. But this idea of pulling our knowledge out of our heads and putting into the digital platforms is, you know, kind of old school knowledge management, but now we're bringing it in with artificial intelligence that in a mu where the systems that you're using are actually learning from you. And it's kind of both freaky, but also, you know, useful in terms of making that system um, behave, you know, support what you're trying to do better. And this is where, you know, that's the platform or network effect. So, the you know, the, the cloud software apps like Determine and others now have, you know, hundreds of companies uh, using the software and that are, you know, that are learning from how those end users are using the system. And that helps inform how to better design the system itself as well as how to better manage the information. So CLM, contract management, is a perfect example of this. How do we go from paper documents to kind of digitized documents to the metadata around those contracts, renewal dates and things, to actually getting into the payload and the data, not the documents, in terms of the the, uh, the atomic level clauses and the metadata at that at that fine you know level in terms of how do we model risks and obligations and 
all these other things, you know, that are out there. So this deeper and richer m management and modeling of this knowledge is really key to uh, solving the complexity of, of that kind of knowledge and being able to use technology to help, you know, simplify the, the process and free you up from, you know, being down at that data level and, you know, managing the plumbing and having you focus much more at the knowledge level and using business analytics and intelligence to really find, you know, uh, opportunities and things that you can, can, can work on. So it's really creating your collective intelligence within your organization, not just within procurement, but within the enterprise and within the supply chain and how do we do that. So you have this top-down kind of piece around, uh, you know, knowledge into um, this collective intelligence as well as this bottoms-up kind of data to, to create this collective intelligence. And cloud and SaaS um, applications are a fundamental, um, you know, kind of have a fundamental role to play in, in, in this area. And this is something that's going to take, you know, uh, m many years to happen, but uh, it's it's kind of amazing the pace of change that's happening with all that data coming online. So, um, uh, Julian, I guess you know in terms of what you see around this kind of you know managing this complexity, and I'm sure you've had to deal with this on how do we bring in unstructured documents and data and all this stuff. Maybe just share a little bit about you know what are some of the biggest uh, changes you see happening as we're trying to move from data information to this kind of, you know, collective intelligence and what that means from a platform perspective. Yeah, sure. And uh, data is key, actually. I mean, data is every, uh, that's what we manage. I mean, that's what the, the platform manage, actually. Uh, actually. I see that as a two different dimension, actually. Uh, one dimension is uh, the, the type of data, data like, uh, I mean, we used to manage master data, right? Uh, pretty, pretty easy. I mean, easy. It's not that easy. But anyway, you have to, to manage the, uh, your master information, like the supplier, like the accounting information, whatever, the, the, the inventory and all of that. So it's the, mason, the master data is the, has been managed for years. Uh, then you have the, the, the transaction data, data the, the B2B, whatever. I mean, you do transactions, you place PO, you, I mean, all of that is already, uh, I mean, giving more and more information, which is pre-structured. So it's kind of easy right now to use this information and to utilize that to, to build a dashboard reporting and to know what's going on. You have a third level, actually, which is not that used. I, I call that the collaboration data. It's basically all this information you, you share uh, during the collab collaboration process, like you send an RFI, you, you, you ask question and answer, uh, you negotiate a contract, so you change whatever you need to change the, the, the information. All of that actually is uh, um, collected by the, by the system, and usually it's not utilized uh, at the way it should be. So that, that's really where we are right now, is taking this information, which is from the collaboration process, and utilizing that across the entire uh, process, actually, from the upstream to the downstream. Uh, and the, the fourth level is, um, is the document level. So you, you have the paper and documents, uh, Word document, PDF, whatever. And in this case, it's kind of very difficult to get the data out of it. And only the, um, as you say, the artificial intelligence, meaning the cognitive uh, algorithm, can digest this type of information and detect actually the, the right information, uh, you know, about uh, contracts is a good example, but uh, the spend classification as well. And out of all this information, you could actually uh, detect a date, you can detect a price index, you can detect a risk level. Uh, all of that is very useful information that you can grab from, uh, from documents. And that's really the next step where we are, we still have some work to do but it's really a big trend. And the other dimension is uh, internal in the data against the global data. Uh, Companies have been managing a lot internal data, what they have. So they have tools, they have transactions, they have PO, they have supplier, they have events, whatever, and they manage this information. And now we are moving into global data, and that means that if you have information about a supplier, you have just your information, but it's much more powerful to get information from outside of your company, 
whatever it's from a third party provider specialized in risk management, whatever it's from other uh, companies or whatever it's from the internet, uh, information about the, what's going on with the supplier, uh, information about uh, what they do and, and everything. So it's really a big trend right now is to be able to manage the private data inside a company to utilize that, but to complement that with all the information you can get whatever from public internet space or from third party providers specializing in collecting data and uh, getting value out of it. So the big challenge for us is really to to use this uh, all, all this data, data, what we call the big data from the global business, uh, internet, cloud, uh, third party providers, but at the same time to manage correctly the meaning, the life cycle of the information which can be everywhere uh, when you do a complete process. Right. And that's that outside-in kind of idea around man managing that big data and, um, you know, all that, all these things that are happening around blockchain, around the shared registry, around all these different process participants. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I would say it is kind of interesting in the, the modern source-to-pay platforms and the discussions that I'm having with the most, the most kind of advanced practitioner organizations are around how do we architect this stuff so that we can thread this process across this data that lives across so many different systems? And to do that, that data isn't necessarily going to be housed just within one giant super app, you know, like, you know, it's not going to just, let's say, be in a determined. Some of that stuff might actually live in these other systems. So you just need to point to it and integrate to it rather than actually just be able to replicate it and just have it within yet another system. So um, this about ability to manage this complex data is, um, it's like an advanced M master data management kind of capability that has to be built inherently into the, the source to pay, you know, platform itself. So uh, I, it, it's some really great points there. So anyway, guys, we're right. Yeah, and then maybe to, just a quick example. Ahead, yeah. Go, yeah. Go, ahead. Go ahead. No, a quick example. For example, what's amazing is, I mean, procurement people, they manage negotiation of price every day. And how do they know what is the best price, actually? How do they know that they should reach this price? Uh, everything is based on their knowledge, on what they do with the supplier, but the information is available. I mean, they should know that the best price they can get is this price, actually, that maybe this price is going to change next month because of the what's going on with the currency or whatever. And I mean, the, the, this information should be given by the, by the platform using information from the cloud and not having to guess about, oh, by the way, I got a really good deal because I got 10% off. As you said, it's all in the B2C world. I mean, uh, all the, the pricing indices, the history, you can go look at airline pricing. You know, there's a lot of sites where you can get a lot of this intelligence and, you know, stuff that we're used to doing on the B2C side and on the sell side. You know, it's uh, it's about time that it's <laughs> starting to come over to the buy side. So anyway, you can't make that happen fast enough, Julian. So, and, and Constantine, um, I know we've been getting some questions. <laughs> we're we're, we're just, working on it. <laughs> yeah, well, we're at the top of the hour, gentlemen, and I, I think this is such a, a an interesting discussion that we pr probably can all get a certificate of some kind of degree here uh, based on the discussion, considering uh, what we're covering. But I do have one question, and we'll kind of cut it off. So if you can stay over just a minute or so to answer this question. The one, the one question that we have is, is you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, discussion of theory here. Is there, is there just one client example of where you feel some of these platform element examples uh, have had the most at play? And this, I think, is probably most directed at, at Julian. So is there there's one example of what you think has had the most impact uh, for, for us and just in general for our clients? What, what would that one uh, technology area be as part of the platform discussion? Maybe I will take the example of uh, Sony, actually, uh, because it's a must, I mean, that's the best example of a company not using a procurement system, but using a system, actually, to manage their business. And wh what they looked at is not a system to place PO or whatever. It's really a system to manage their, uh, their real business. And for that, they need much more than just a, a tool they needed a complete configurable system where they could put all their business process, business rules, 
uh, onboard every single employee in the company uh, and get the end results from start to end full collaboration with the, all the, the third party uh, contractor supplier waiver. And I think that's a pretty good example of a, of a company looking at the, at the platform instead of looking at the, at the solution to, uh, solution to manage spend. Actually, uh, I mean, I mean we, we could talk about that for 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 a long time, but uh, that may be the best example. But we have others. Yeah, supplier well, management is, is an awesome one. That one just you know completely uh, driven outside in. You know, based on the level, the type of supplier regulations in force all the compliance requirements, how do you really guide the supplier management, you know, process on the data that you ask from the supplier, you know, based on what they really need, rather than a one-size-fits-all, you know, fill out the 50 forms. So um, there's so much stuff in this webcast, and, you know, it's, it might seem like theory, but really there's hundreds of procurement organizations that are already doing little pieces of this. So, um you know, I think that the Sony one's a great example. So, I'm sorry, Constance. Yeah. Well, no, that's fine. I, I really appreciate you guys joining us here on the forum, and I think we're gonna we we can, to your point, Pierre, address. Uh, maybe more of these types of things in the future, and really hitting at some some you know some some areas that. Uh, you know, can hit this home further as, as this, these ideas evolve. So with that, though, taking the time, we appreciate everybody joining us. We really thank you for, for joining us on the webinar, and uh, we look forward to giving you more of these types of discussions in the future. So everybody have a great rest of your day, and we'll be in touch in the future. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.